advanced weapons systems in space. The concept of space weaponry goes back a long time. The Nazis wanted to orbit a large mirror that would be focused on its enemies down on the Earth. Let's evaluate different weapon systems that would work well in space. Lasers instantly come to mind. Laser stands for light amplification by the stimulated emission of radiation. It takes electrical, chemical, or photonic energy, which is random, and produces a much more powerful, coherent beam of light. This used to confuse me. How can the same amount of energy be deadly if it's coherent, and benign if it's random? Think of a group of men trying to overturn a car. If they each randomly push on the car, they will fail. If they coordinate their pushes rocking the car, they can use the same amount of force, but it is much more effective. We will examine some examples of space laser weapons and look to the future. Charged or neutral particle beams have also been tested. These are devices that produce a stream of fast, high-energy atoms that travel through space and strike a target, almost like a cosmic ray generator. One of these was tested in 1989 and was codenamed BEAR for beam accelerator aboard a rocket. And the Pentagon wants to test another one in 2023 as well as other laser systems. Think of a particle beam weapon as an atomic railgun. To be effective, these systems had to have a considerable length, up to 22 meters. However, recent advances in Wakefield accelerators could dramatically reduce this size. Wakefield accelerators use very short pulses of laser light, usually just femtoseconds long, to boost particles to near light speed. Charged energy particle beams eject ions at high speed using electromagnetic fields. Neutral energy particle beams usually use lasers or radio waves to accelerate the particles. While you often hear people say that weapons are not allowed in space, this is not true. Weapons of mass destruction, like nuclear weapons, are banned by the 1967 Outer Space Treaty. Everything else is fair game. There is a fear that an arms race in space will be detrimental to the expansion of humanity in space. But as soon as one nation develops a weapon, the others feel they must match it. The U.S. was the first nation to destroy a satellite in orbit, creating a huge amount of debris. This was back in the 1980s. It was an anti-satellite missile fired from an F-15 at high altitude. Since that time, Russia, China, and India have all tested similar weapons. The Russians routinely include a firearm on the Soyuz capsules, in case they come down in Siberia away from where they expected. Wolves, bears, and all that. The Soviets have actually already put a cannon in space. It was called the R-23M Kartek. It was a modified aircraft cannon used on the Tupolev-22 Blinder, which was a Soviet supersonic bomber. The cannon was installed on the Almaz, or Diamond, space station in the 1970s. The Almaz was an almost entirely military space station. This cannon was actually fired in space. This was unknown to most of the world until the fall of the Soviet Union, when it was disclosed on a Russian television show. The cannon fired 14.5 millimeter rounds at a rate of up to 5,000 shots per minute. The shells massed 200 grams and had a velocity of about 690 meters per second. It had a maximum range on Earth of over 3 kilometers and effectively targeted a gas canister about 1.5 kilometers away. The Almaz station has a mass of 20 tons and the entire station had to be reoriented to aim the cannon. The Soviets put up the first civilian space station called Soyuz before the Americans orbited Skylab in 1973. They put up a total of seven stations, with two of them secretly being military Almaz stations. The cannon was fired from the Soyuz 3 space station January 24, 1975. This was done remotely after the station had been evacuated. The station would fire its station keeping thrusters to counteract the impulse from the cannon firing. The cannon fired several short blasts, putting about 20 shells into space, but in such a direction that they burned up in the atmosphere. Popular Mechanics has an excellent article on this. The cosmonauts on the Almaz space station were also supposed to be equipped with a nifty space laser, in case the U.S. tried to overrun their space station to see what they were doing. It would actually not have been powerful enough to burn through a suit, but it could possibly blind sensitive optics on approaching spacecraft or satellites. It had a power of about 10 joules, and it had 10 millimeter rounds to produce this pulse of light. 
These cartridges were single use and you would have to rack the chamber manually for each fire as there would be no noticeable recoil. They also made a revolver that would have allowed more rapid fire. It may also have had a strap-on battery to power other parts of the device. The chemicals were reportedly non-toxic and fire safe. There was a lamp filled with oxygen that contained a metallic foil made of zirconium, which produces three times more energy than magnesium when burned. An yttrium aluminum garnet or YAG crystal then generated coherent infrared light from the bright flash. The flash would last about 10 milliseconds, producing a temperature of 5,000 Kelvin. It was only effective over about 20 meters. The Soviets also designed robotic spacecraft to approach, inspect, and possibly disable enemy satellites. There was a fear that nations would put atomic weapons into orbit, dropping them over the enemy's cities at a moment's notice. The problem is that even in low Earth orbit, it takes about 90 minutes to circle the Earth. You would only pass over your target about that often. Intercontinental ballistic missiles can make it to the opposite side of the Earth in 28 minutes and were not such an easy target in the first strike. When you have the orbital perimeters of a space weapon system, or just good radar, you know exactly where they are at any time. There are, undoubtedly, space weapons being designed and possibly deployed right now that will not be declassified for several decades. The U.S. has a communications denial weapon system available right now. This is not a true space weapon, as it is flown in an aircraft over the battlefield to jam the enemy's satellite communications. Called the Counter Communications System, it is controlled by U.S. Space Force and jams enemy satellite systems preventing data links from functioning. The system was introduced in 2004 and has been updated since. Other nations, including China and Russia, are working on these systems, and Russia has deployed a similar system called the Tyrata 2S, which is in operation now. No discussion of space weapons would be complete without discussing the Strategic Defense Initiative, also known as Star Wars, started by President Ronald Reagan in 1983. This system was being designed to take out incoming ICBMs before they detonated over the United States. These devices included small atomic bombs that, as they exploded, would produce high-power X-ray or gamma-ray lasers that would be aimed simultaneously at several multiple re-entry vehicles as they came out of the atmosphere in their ballistic arc. There was also a system called Brilliant Pebbles that was basically a space shotgun. A projectile fired through space is called a kinetic kill vehicle and is a small rocket that approaches the target and explodes with shrapnel focused on the target. This would be similar to modern anti-aircraft systems like the Russian Buk. The Strategic Defense Initiative also looked at particle beams. Orbital bombardment is when bombs or kinetic weapons like the Rods of God made of tungsten, described recently by the angry astronaut, are used to strike targets from space. These tungsten rods are, however, very massive and would be difficult to orbit. Then you have all the problems we discussed earlier of orbital limitations. Hypersonic ICBMs will probably always be a better choice, at least on Earth. However, for an outpost on the moon, this could be a very effective offensive and defensive weapon system. One thing rarely discussed is that every spaceship in the future will be armed with laser weapons or charged energy particle beams. If you are going to have large spaceships carrying hundreds of people, you can't move it out of the way at a moment's notice. Active radar, lidar, and infrared sensors will have to continuously monitor for micrometeoroid threats. These will have to be neutralized before they can impact. Every one of these defensive systems can also be turned to offense. Rail guns are also being developed on Earth. The United States Navy has fielded a very powerful weapon that fires a kinetic projectile a great distance. These will be much more effective in space without air friction. The main difficulty with all these systems is power. Until we develop supercapacitors that can store enormous amounts of electrical power, we are limited in firing a projectile at high speed or powering laser and energy beam weapons. Lasers only convert about 20% of the energy pumped into them to coherent light. Microwave beams can be up to 90% efficient and may be a better choice in the future. Laser defense systems used for the occasional incoming micrometeoroid could be effectively powered by a chemical reaction. In a space battle, the time between charging your capacitors, or when you run out of chemical reagents, could mean losing the confrontation. As our power storage systems improve, these systems will become more powerful and practical. The deadliest possible space weapon would be a neutral particle beam of antimatter. Nothing you deliver to a target can possibly carry more destructive power per gram. The Large Hadron Collider at CERN routinely produces antimatter beams for particle physics experiments. 
One of the hardest things about these systems is maintaining a vacuum in the ring for the beam to travel through without impacting gas molecules. This won't really be much of a problem on the moon. Imagine a ring of electromagnetic accelerators spaced about a kilometer apart around the entire equator of the moon. Particles could be accelerated to incredible velocities and then aimed at incoming asteroids or other threats, including attacking spacecraft. Such a beam would be the most effective way to redirect an incoming asteroid. You would not have to destroy the asteroid. The impacting antimatter would quickly dig a crater into the asteroid with a jet of energy providing a type of thruster to alter the asteroid's course. When it comes to power storage, large solar-powered lasers at the Mercury-Sun L1 Lagrange point could produce very powerful beams of energy, either laser light or by focusing the solar wind into a focused powerful beam using solar-powered electromagnetic fields to focus and accelerate the particles. These beams could impact the iron on Mercury producing antimatter that could then be harvested and stored in electromagnetic bottles powered by the few antimatter reactions that escaped containment. These antimatter batteries would be the ultimate power source, better than fusion. These batteries could be used to power propulsion and weapon systems. Until this is possible, fusion is also a possibility. Helium-3 is a good source of aneutronic fusion fuel and can be mined on the moon and in the far future collected from Neptune. This would also be a very effective power source for propulsion and weapon systems until antimatter can be harvested. So space weapons will include lasers, masers, particle beams, and kinetic weapons. The best depiction of space-based kinetic weapons was probably seen in the Expanse series. The best depiction of directed energy weapons is probably Star Trek, which also accurately predicted the use of antimatter as the best power source. Thank you for listening. Like and subscribe to continue training and be safe.